Hi, everyone, and welcome to AAPI Communities in Conversation, a series of live online conversations between writers, creators, and librarians that centers Asian American and Pacific Islander voices, books, cultures, and experiences. This monthly program is hosted by the University of South Carolina's Augusta Baker Endowed Chair, Publishers Weekly, and the Penguin Random House Library Marketing. My name is Crystal Chen, and I am the Teen Center Coordinator at the New York Public Library. Joining me today is the esteemed children's book author, Andrea Wang. Her book, Watercrest, was awarded the Caldecott Medal, a Newbery Honor, the Asian Pacific American Award for Literature, a New England Book Award, and a Boston Globe Horn Book Honor. Her other picture books, Magic Ramen and The Neon Monster, have also received several awards and starred reviews. Today, we will be discussing Andrea's middle grade book, The Many Meetings of Milan, which received accolades from the Center for the Study of Multicultural Children's Literature, the New York Public Library, the New York Times, and School Library Journal, and is a 2022 Chinese American Librarians Association Best Book Award Honor Book and a 2022 Ohio Inna Book Award finalist. Andrea, thank you for joining us today. Our library and publishing colleagues are so excited to hear from you. Thank you so much, Crystal. And thank you everyone for having me here today. It's a pleasure. So to get us started, I thought maybe you could first tell us a bit about your upbringing and how you first got started in your writing career. Yeah, sure. Um, I am, I call it first generation, but it's first generation born here. Some people say that the immigrants are the first generation. My parents immigrated from um, China they had escaped um, after the Chinese Civil War to Hong Kong and Taiwan, so they were part of the diaspora. And they ended up here uh, in the 1960s, late 1960s, and uh, they came for graduate school, and I was born um, in 1970 and grew up in a very small town in Ohio. So if you've read Watercress or Melon, that is very much, you know, my experience growing up there. And um, I first started writing because I was such a shy kid and I just lived in books and started writing for school and just thought, oh, well, I'll just keep writing stories because that's what was in my head all the time were stories. And I remember that a poem of mine got published in the local newspaper. I mean, it was like the entire class's poems got published. So it wasn't like I was special or anything, but I was like, wow, I really, I, I like this. And so I was kind of hooked, but I took a detour away from writing um, because my parents wanted me to do something a little bit more professional and, um, and stable. <laughs> and I came back to it when my kids were born and uh, yeah. That's my full-time job now. That's so relatable, the, the thing about <laughs> parents wanting you to take on more like professional jobs. <laughs> Prove them wrong though. Uh, so how do you gain inspiration for your books? Um, how much of it is drawn from imagination versus research versus your own real life experiences? It's definitely a combination. And I think sort of the amount of each differs with each book. So, you know, the real life experiences definitely plays into Watercress and Melon. Those are sort of the books that are most um, drawn from my own memories and experiences. And, you know, even for Magic Ramen, though, it started off being a real life experience of having really picky children <laughs> and all they would eat was ramen. And so I got interested and pulled into the topic that way. And, you know, there was a lot of research because that was nonfiction, but there's still a lot of research for fiction. I did a lot of research for Melon. I think you have a question about that later on. But so it's it's always for me, you know, a mix of things. I keep notebooks of story ideas, whether it's a memory or, you know, something that I've just experienced in real life or something I've read. You know, I, I used to write down all the weird facts I came across reading the news. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I take those notebooks out occasionally and I'll flip through them and merge things together. Um, and, you know, I actually have a, a slide I show during school visits where I've taken like, oh, I had an idea about let's set a story in a Chinese bakery, mostly because I really love Chinese pastries. Or, you know, let's talk about, um, you know, what it's like to move from one place to another, or what it's like to grow up in Chinatown. And then I merged all those things into Milan. 
I love the idea that there's all these books with possible potential stories in the future <laughs> for us. That's wonderful. Um, so several of your books, like The Many Meanings of Milan and Watercress, reference true historical events. Could yeah. you tell us more about your research process and the kinds of challenges or successes that you encountered throughout it? Sure. So Watercress wasn't a lot of research so much as introspection because that was semi-autobiographical. So the challenge there was to just sit down and really allow myself to feel everything that I had been feeling as a young child growing up in a very predominantly white community. And um, for Melan, though, the research came in um, because I wanted, you know, I needed to research Boston Chinatown because it's changed since I lived in Boston. And I wanted to make sure that everything was really accurate and really authentic. And, um, you know, there was also a lot of research about, you know, my, uh, what do I want to say? I, I actually had to grapple with some of my own internal biases, right? So I was researching colorism and I was researching, you know, um, anti-Asian uh, hate crimes. And, you know, I could get really lost in the weeds in the research because I really love doing that and love learning new things. But um, you can't always pack everything <laughs> that you've learned into one book. So <laughs> as I discovered, that was the challenge was, was figuring out what belonged and what didn't. Um, that's really interesting to hear, especially because a lot of people don't presume that um, fictional books require this kind of research, and they do, and it really does show. Uh, so another question I have is, uh, how did the COVID-19 pandemic affect your life and work? And did you uh, feel changed by it as a writer? Yeah, I was thinking about this. Um, you know, I said I was shy. I'm, I'm a total introvert. So in that sense, it being home on lockdown didn't really change my day-to-day -day life. My children did come home, one was at college. Um, and so, you know, my husband was working remotely. So the house was suddenly full of people and I couldn't hear myself think and I couldn't hear my characters think. And it didn't help that I don't have doors to my office or I didn't then, I do now as you can see behind me because it became a necessity. But, um, you know, I, I had to learn to work and write with you know the hubbub of a household around me again and um as a writer i you know there was i've had to grapple more with the fact of anti-asian violence it's you know increased since the pandemic i mean it's it's been a fact all along unfortunately since we've been in this country but uh you know just the amount of it now. I, I find myself, you know, wanting to address that more and more in the books that I write and to counter that narrative that Chinese Americans are to blame for COVID or for our job situation, our economy, etc. So in that way, I think it's changed how I feel as a writer. I'm a little bit more outspoken now than I used to be. I really appreciate hearing that because for sure, like the, the rise in anti-Asian violence, it's really great that there are books like this that kids can turn to, um, to talk out some of those feelings and experiences. Um, so what are the most challenging and rewarding aspects of being a writer? And what are some misconceptions that people may have about writers or writing? <laughs> I think the biggest misconception is that it's easy. You know, like the amount of people who will say, oh, I've always wanted to write a picture book or I've always wanted to write the next great American novel or, you know, they think it's really simple that you just sit down and and spew out words. Um, so the biggest challenge, I think, for me, for picture books is finding the right word. You know, there's so few words to play with. People don't realize how challenging it is to write 500 words and have them all um, you know, make a cohesive story, you know, and, and, and carry emotional weight, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the same thing with writing longer works like The Many Meanings of Melan, you still want all the words to, you know, 
uh, bring out the theme to, you know, carry a voice, et cetera. And so that is challenging. The research is challenging. Um, but the most rewarding thing really is the children, the readers, right? Um, to have books like this when I was a child, I think would have really made a difference for me. Not that they didn't exist. I mean, they did exist. It just was not available in my small town library and there was no internet then, I'm that old. And <laughs> you know, you couldn't Google for like books about Chinese American characters the way you can now. And so I just didn't see myself reflected in books as a child. So I think if there's one kid, one grown up reader who feels seen reading one of my books, that is really the most rewarding thing. I love that because I had that same experience and so many times I will read your books um, and other authors and just be like, I really wish I had this when I was a kid and now it's here. So that's great. <laughs> um, so in the many meanings of Milan, names and naming play an important role in the story. The principal, Mr. Renard, places an unwelcome nickname, Melanie, on Milan. Mm -hmm. Mr. Renard's own name alludes to his character and Milan uses the different meanings of her name as a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. So why are names important, particularly when it comes to issues of identity? Well, at its most basic, names give other people something to call us, right? They identify us. And I feel like it's you know, we all want a name that reflects who we feel we are inside. And sometimes the, the name that our parents gives us, give us matches with that. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, I think it's really wonderful that we can find and choose our own names, uh, you know, as we grow older. I have had friends and relatives who have, were given you know, Chinese names that were transliterated and maybe they felt like that wasn't um, what they wanted and they've chosen more western names for themselves and i think it also reflects you know at what time period we were born right when i was born um in the united states in the 70s it was all about assimilating into white culture and so my parents gave me my english name andrea and they gave me a chinese middle name um, which nobody could pronounce you know, it's it's yi rule, and it's really hard to say. And the way it was transliterated from the Cantonese um, did not sound great to my eyes, to my ears. And I didn't like when people mispronounced it constantly. So I would make up middle names for myself that started with a Y. Like people would say, oh, what's the Y stand for? I'd be like, oh, Yvette or Yolanda or, you know, just anything that was easier and sort of traditionally Western and easy to say. Um, so I think it's really, you know, names are just so fundamentally a part of ourselves. And I wanted to explore what it was like to have that taken away from you. You know, she moves from this community where she's loved and welcomed and surrounded by people who look like her and speak, you know, Mandarin or, you know, other dialects of Chinese. And, and then she moves to this very small town in Ohio, very similar to the one where I grew up. And suddenly she's sort of stripped of both her endearing affectionate nickname that her family calls her as well as her her name um, at school and uh, how that I, I was just really interested to see how that affects someone's um, personality and their you know um, yeah their ability to cope with the world right you know I mean Melan has a very hard time answering to Melanie because she's never had to before she's 12 she's like I have no idea who this person is. So well, those are some of the things I wanted to, to take on in the book. You know, we talked a little bit earlier about like, I had a similar name journey, but also just when you're a young kid um, in school, like trying to find yourself who yeah. you are, what your name is and what people call you is really important. Um, so my next question is, opinion is intentionally used throughout the many meanings mm -hmm. of Milan, and you discuss it in the author's note. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us more about the significance of opinion and why you chose to incorporate it in the book? Yeah, you know, it's, my father was a history professor, but he was sort of a, an amateur linguist as well. He spoke many different dialects, and, um, you know, I would sort of help him with his work sometimes. I'd proofread his English um documents that he was writing and in turn he would talk to me about you know 
he wanted me to learn Chinese and there was no Chinese school in the small town that I grew up in. And so he taught me pinging. He showed me dictionaries. He also talked to me about the other ways of transliterating um, Chinese or Mandarin. You know, there's older ways called Wade Giles and, and all, you know, there, sometimes you see them with many apostrophes, you know, and uh, so those are some of the other methods of transliterating. Um, and, you know, Meilan's family comes from Taiwan, which doesn't have a unified transliteration method. So it's kind of a combination of pinging and Wade Giles and, and other um, methods. But I stuck with the pinging because I didn't want to confuse the readers. And because that is mainly the way that um, students in the United States learn to speak Mandarin um, Chinese is through pinging because it's you know brought into the Roman alphabet. And uh, one of my pet peeves is reading um, or coming across pinging in other books, but not having the tones reflected. And then, you know, if you've read Meilan, you know that Chinese is a tonal language and it really matters what tone it's in because it changes the, the, the meaning of the word completely. Um, and so I, my, my grasp of Mandarin is not good enough to say, oh, well, that should be this tone in this word. So I was reading it and I'm like, I don't know what this means. And I'd have to, you know, either look it up or pick it up from context. So it was really important to me to put in the tone marks. Um, so, you know, as I say in, in my author's notes so that readers and, and learners of Mandarin can actually sound it out for themselves and have an easier time. So, um, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> That was something that I definitely noticed when I was reading the book, because I, as you said, sometimes Pinion is in other books, but there is no way to tell which word they're actually <laughs> referencing without the correct tones. And I think this is another way to like, for this book to be really accessible to um, young readers who are learning that language. And it was fun for me as somebody who doesn't read the, the Mandarin characters, like this was actually really fun for me. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, and okay, so the other, the next question I have um, is the, the young characters in your books often deal with difficult or challenging situations. For example, Melon comes up against the racist Mr. Reynard who tries to constantly constrain and label her. Um, even with her friend Logan, Melon experiences alienation and must explain to him why being called exotic is hurtful. Um, what advice would you give young people who find themselves in similar situations? So what do you hope young readers might gain overall from reading your books? Yeah, I sort of want, I wanted to accurately portray some of the microaggressions that um, I experienced as a child, as well as some of the more common ones that AAPI experienced still. And, you know, I think the advice that I would give is the same advice that um, if, if people have taken classes in sort of like bystander training um, in dealing with macro or microaggressions or racist incidents, you know, you can either address it directly and call it out, but I tell kids that only if you feel like this is a safe space and you're supported in this, you know, if you don't feel safe, don't address it directly, you know, always think about your own personal safety first. And you can distract the person um, and Melon does do this in the book and you know she she switches the topic of conversation or she talks to someone else and and brings up something tries to distract um from what's going on or you can delegate you can ask someone else maybe a friend or something to step in and um you know address that for you she does call on sort of someone in her class to talk about you know uh, to address a microaggression that she experiences. And what I usually do and have done since I was a child um, was delay, like I'll just walk away or I'll just, you know, I won't say anything in the moment. Maybe I'll talk to someone about it later. Um, and that's also really valid. You just really need to do what you're comfortable with. Um, and I hope that young people reading the book you know, my editor and I worked a lot on the language in those sections. I hope now that they can come away with a little bit of their own language for explaining why, say, being called exotic can be hurtful um, and, and be able to express that to their own classmates and, you know, or to just to talk about it among their friends and, and commiserate. 
I love that. I think it's really important to like talk a lot of these things out. And I think kids yeah. will find this book empowering because I found it empowering as an adult. <laughs> um, so this is a question about sort of like all, all the books that you've written. Um, yeah. uh, so which of your books was the, the hardest to write? Which was your favorite to write? And which book transformed the most throughout the writing process? Hmm. So I think the book that was hardest to write was Watercraft and also the one that probably transformed the most. Um, it started out being a personal essay that I wrote after my mother passed away. So there was a lot of grief to it that I had to process. And that's what I do to process my emotions and experiences is write about it. And over time that transformed into a picture book. And you know, then over many more years, it transformed into what got published, uh, which was kind of a very spare, you know, free verse poem, if you will. And that I think I had to really, you know, dig into my own feelings and open myself up and just be completely vulnerable, which is really scary. <laughs> so that was the, the hardest book to write. Um, Melon was probably my favorite to write. It was just such a joy. I mean, I also was talking about losing family, right? She moves away. She loses her best friend, who's her cousin, because they have a, the whole family has a quarrel and, you know, the extended family breaks apart. Um, so there's still those issues of, of grief and loss that she's dealing with, but it was so nice to, to have them be brought back together. Sorry, spoiler alert, you know, like it, it doesn't end like necessarily the way that Melon hopes it ends, you know, like with them moving back to where her extended family lives, but you know, they come to some sort of a new understanding um, of each other. And I just loved revisiting, you know, Boston Chinatown and Yellow Springs. The town that I grew up in is the, you know, Red Bud, Red Bud is the fictionalized version of the town I grew up in. And, you know, some of my favorite places are in there. And it was just really such a joy to kind of relive that um, and, and have it turn out the way I had hoped my childhood had turned out. <laughs> so Milan is your debut middle grade book, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and you said you mentioned it's your favorite book to write. Did you find it harder or easier to write like a middle grade chapter book versus a lot of the picture books you've written before? Um, it's always like a challenge to switch to a different format. Right. I had been so used to writing very spare. I think Watercrest is 499 words, not including the back matter. And that my first draft of Melon was also very spare. And when my editor, um, Joanna Cardenas, who's amazing, she's like, Yeah, I think you need to beef up this section. And, you know, you need maybe some more chapters showing her journey from Boston Chinatown to Ohio. Let's see this road trip. I was like, really? I can write all that? <laughs> you know, like, I don't have to just jump from here to here. I can actually show all of that on the page, which was very liberating in a way, you know, and also just to create that world uh, was really, really fun. Um, you know, with picture books, half of the book are, you know, is is the illustrations, And so there's a lot of detail and adjectives that I don't put in. And so it was really fun to just kind of go crazy with adjectives and descriptions and um, use Melon's. Melon has a very lyrical voice and I loved doing that, um, expressing her, her point of view from this sort of fairy tale lens that she has, because she loves fairy tales. So that was just so fun. Yeah, I love that. I don't usually think of it that way with middle grade books that you have to be both the writer and the artist by painting the picture for the reader. <laughs> That's great. Um, what advice would you give new writers, particularly those working within children's literature? I know almost everybody says this, but it's so true. Read, read everything, you know, especially the, the type of book that you want to write, because that's how you learn, um, you know, the I think the basic blocks of story. And I also find critiquing incredibly helpful, not just your own work, but to join a critique group and to critique other people's work because you're, I'm so close to my own work, it's hard to see its flaws, 
right? But if you're someone else's critique partner or, you know, it kind of, and doing those, that editorial letter, as it were, you, it's easier to analyze someone else's work and that helps you in turn analyze your own. So read and, you know, critique. If you can't tell, I'm actually taking notes during this. I'm like, this oh. is all valuable information. I need to write this stuff down for myself and others. Um, um, it's recorded. <laughs> um, so the next question I have, and we're getting close to the end of the questions, and then we're going to turn into the um, the Q and A. And I, I saw a, a few really great questions in the chat. Um, so, what project or uh, projects do you currently have upcoming that we can look forward to? So um, I did have a book, Luli in the Language of Tea, that just came out in May, and it's all about the word for tea and how it's similar in over 200 languages and how it brings together um, a group of children who are from all different countries. I should have pulled it out. Let's see. I'll show you the cover. Um, and then I have a second middle grade that I'm working on, um, also with Joanna at Kokila. It's not titled yet, but it is a camp story, a summer camp story about a Chinese American girl who goes, um, who has been attending a Chinese heritage camp ever since she was six. And this is her last year at camp and a bunch of new girls come in and she has to figure out how to cope with that and deal with that. But uh, I think it's much more of a lighthearted story. I think we all, you know, with the pandemic, it's been three years of like virtual summer camp and and you know, or or hybrid summer camp. And I think it'd be really fun. I hope it's really fun for kids to go back and read about an actual summer camp experience. So I think that's coming out in 2024. I also have a picture book coming out that year um, called, for now, Worthy, uh, The Brave and Capable Life of Joseph Pierce. So not very many people know that uh, Chinese people fought in the Civil War, the American Civil War. And there were not many, but they all took, interestingly enough, very westernized names. So Joseph Pierce does not scream, I'm a Chinese American <laughs> in any way, but he was born in China and brought here as a young boy um, and raised in a ship captain's family in Connecticut. And so it is based on his story. It's mostly nonfiction. Um, and so I'm excited for that sort of uh, a little bit more of, you know, Asian American history coming to light. Uh, I just learned about Joseph Pierce recently. And oh, I, yeah? Yeah, and I just like appreciate those kinds of stories because I think it's a good reminder that um, Asian Americans have been a part of U.S. history for a very long time. Like we're not all just recent immigrants, you know. Um, <laughs> right. So it's, it's I, I love that reminder. And I also want to say I read Luli and the Language for Tea, and I <laughs> love that one as well. And it's such a great book about community, especially through like tea, which is like such an important part of my life and our culture. So, yeah. Um, and then my last question before the Q&A, uh, what books have you been reading lately that you've enjoyed or would recommend for any age level? Okay, so I have a stack here. I'll start with the one I just read that I think just came out. It's called You Are Life by Bao Fi, illustrated by Hannah Lee. It's a picture book. It's a poem. It's it's an anthem to Asian American children and, you know, an ode and it, it's, you know, I mean, it starts off like you are not a virus. And I was just like, oh, that really hits home. And Bao um, Fi says in his author's note that he was inspired, um, motivated maybe by the rise in anti-Asian violence during COVID, that he wanted to give Asian American children um, something hopeful, right? So it, it talks about you are not an invader. You are not always foreign. You are not invisible. You are everything. You are life. You can be anything, do anything. And so it's just that really spoke to me. Um, and out today is Sweet and Sour by Debbie Michiko Florence, who's actually one of my best friends, but this is an awesome book. Uh, it's a tween uh, romance, uh, and it's told in this really wonderful format where she has flashbacks as to what is sweet and what is sour in her relationship with her best friend, Zach. So this is my and this is Zach. And um, it takes place in Mystic, Connecticut, where Debbie lives. So it's really lovely from that um, aspect too, to, to see a little bit of 
you know, that town. And I'm speaking with Christina Soonternvat today about her book, The Tryout. And um, this is a middle grade graphic novel. I have the arc, so it's not in color, but it's, uh, it's, you know, it's autobiographical. This is about her experience growing up in small town Texas and trying out to be on the cheerleading team. So this gave me all the feel too. It's really funny, but it's also like really cringy in parts. <laughs> so it was just, it's really good. So those three, I would definitely recommend. I love that you're so prepared with the book so we can see oh. the covers and everything. Um, I will definitely add all of those books to my degrees. Yay! So we're going to turn to the audience for a Q&A and Grace actually added um, a few questions. So I'm going to add uh, read them in pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is sort of related. Uh, who were your favorite authors growing up, especially Asian and Asian Americans? Oh, so like I said, I really didn't read any Asian American authors growing up because my small town library, my school library didn't have them. Um, you know, the first one I really, I remember reading that had a huge impact on me was the Joy Luck Club, but that wasn't until college. Um, the books, the picture books that I read as a small child that had Asian characters in them were all written by white people you know, like, what is it? I think it's Ping. This, there's a duck, the story of Ping, which is terrible. The five Chinese brothers. <laughs> so, um, I do not recommend those, but that's what I grew up with. Uh, so my favorite books were the ones about feisty girls like Anne of Green Gables and Caddy Woodlawn. Again, they're not Asian American characters, but I just love that they were able to express themselves and, you know, um, pursue their dreams in a way that I didn't feel that I was able to because I had a lot of I felt a lot of weight of my parental expectations so um those are the books I loved oh you're still muted crystal Oops, sorry <laughs> so uh grace had some additional questions which was uh, did you grow up with Chinese myths and tales and how did your father's work as a professor influence your writing I grew up with a few Chinese myths and tales, but I read many more of them while I was researching for Meilan. Um, and I love that there are so many Asian inspired fantasies now based on, you know, Asian mythologies. And I, um, I read a lot of fairy tales and the, there's a series of books, like, I guess they're called the color fairy tale books. It's like the green book of, of fairy tales or the, the golden book of fairy tales. So I read all of those. Um, and there were some that were set in Asia that I, I don't quite remember, but I do remember reading them. Um, and uh, let's see, so my father's work as a professor, <laughs> It influenced my writing in the sense that I was his proofreader. And I don't know how many other folks who have grown up in bilingual homes or children of immigrants found this to be the case too. But, you know, my parents were on the one hand really happy, you know, even though they didn't want me to be an author, they were really happy that I, um, you know, could speak and write English really well. And so they would hand me all their stuff, you know, to read like letters to their bosses or whatever documents they were working on, essays, et cetera. And so that helped um, because the more I did that, the more, you know, sort of grammar I unconsciously absorbed. Um, and, you know, his work as a professor probably has influenced me most. After he passed away, he left me all his books. And so when I was researching for Melan, all I had to do was go down to my basement and be like, oh, I've seen this book that my dad had about, you know, filial piety. Uh, you know, the very, there's a lot of filial piety in Melan. And, and a, it, that was one of my themes in the beginning that I wanted to write about was this, you know, sense of duty to your parents. And so I was reading a lot of that. Over the summers when I was little, the thing I most hated was that my father would try and, and, and teach my, you know, me and my brother about Chinese philosophy, because there were no summer programs, you know, at that time. Um, and he would give us 
you know, I don't know, section from either the Analects of Confucius or, you know, Mencius's writings and ask us to translate them from Chinese into English and then write an essay about what it meant, which was just like the worst cover ever, but it did have a lot of influence on me. And that sort of uh, has come out in my writing from time to time, especially in my lawn. Something about dads. I was just gonna say like, <laughs> I have had experiences where I would just like sneak magazines into books and just like, yes, I am studying, but I would just be reading a magazine or something. But anyways, I, I relate to that very much. Um, so uh, another question, let's see, I think I had another couple of questions. Oh, so um, somebody asked, would you be able to speak about the experience of writing nonfiction books? And they referenced the library series, which included Malala Yousafzai. Yeah, um, so those are right for hire books. When I was first starting out, I um, worked with an editorial company called Redline Editorial, and they would from time to time send me um, a list of books uh, in a series, and they were looking for writers. And because I have a background in science, I thought this was really, you know, this is easy. I can, I know how to do you know, this, I can research things, I can write, essentially, I mean, I don't want to trivialize it, but I, I kind of call it like it's a book report for third graders, you know, <laughs> um, or it's like, a. so these nonfiction books were fun. Um, and I really learned how to, you know, write quickly and develop, you know, sidebar information, back matter. So this is kind of probably why there's back matter in every one of my, you know, trade published books is because I learned from that experience um, and I loved it. I love learning about Malala Yousafzai or, you know, my background was in environmental science. So the books I wrote about oil pollution were, you know, very near and dear to my heart um, in that sense. And it was, it felt great to be able to use my, you know, my undergraduate and graduate degrees in science for in, in, in my writing. Um, but it, you know, it's very low paying is what I'll say about that. <laughs> and the deadlines are really, really tight. <laughs> so I have a, a, a final question, unless anybody yeah. wants to add more in the chat. And this one, I feel like it might be for Miriam. And I feel like she might be hungry because she asked the question of uh, oh. like the kinds of comfort food that you might recommend during the pandemic or just in general. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? the kinds of comfort food that you may oh. recommend, um, especially during like a pandemic or in general, when maybe some of these kids are going through challenging circumstances, yeah. A lot of my comfort foods ended up in the many meanings of Milan. I love egg custard tarts, danta, um, and I love roast pork buns. Pretty much anything with carbs is my jam. Um, and, it's odd, but the comfort food of my youth is craft macaroni and cheese. I think it's so American, but it was so easy. You know, my mom was a nurse. She worked a lot. So we learned how to make that for ourselves. And um, oddly, it was not instant ramen. I mean, we had instant ramen, but I don't feel like it was that easy to get in rural Ohio. And uh, I just remember that as sort of like a when we were on road trips, my parents would bring that into our hotel rooms and make it so that we didn't have to spend money on dinner. Um, but my comfort foods are definitely um, pastries. <laughs> my my brother would 100% agree with you about the Kraft macaroni and cheese because he was very much obsessed with that growing up. <laughs> Um, so I think that is all the questions we have for today. So Andrea, I want to thank you so much for spending this time with us and um, engaging this conversation. And I also want to thank, uh, thank our host, Dr. Nicole Cook, the University of South Carolina's Augusta Baker and Dow Chair, Publishers Weekly, and Penguin Random House Library Marketing. Um, and a very special thank you to our audience for joining us today. Um, this webinar um, has been recorded and will be available for future viewing. Um, and we'll, we hope that you'll join the next AAPI Communities and Conversation events on October 4th with guest author Waiki Wang in conversation with Lalitha Nataraj of California State University, St. Marcos University Library. So thank you all very much and have a great day.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Thank you, Crystal. <laughs>